We're now just a little more than 100 days until the election, and the race for the White House has been turned upside down. We have a new victim to defeat, Lion Kamala Harris. If you don't mind, I'm not going to be nice. Is that OK? We are in a fight for our most fundamental freedoms. And I say, bring it on. The Trump team had a plan to defeat Joe Biden. But with Kamala Harris as his opponent, it's a whole new race. Next. This is Washington Week with The Atlantic. Corporate funding provided by... Consumer Cellular, this is Sam. How may I help you? This is a pocket dial. Well, somebody's pocket. Thought I'd let you know that with Consumer Cellular, you get nationwide coverage with no contract. That's kind of our thing. Have a nice day. Additional funding is provided by Koo and Patricia Ewens with the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Once again, from Washington, Editor-in-Chief of The Atlantic and moderator, Jeffrey Goldberg. Good evening and welcome to Washington Week. If you had fallen into a coma on June 26th and had awoken, say, yesterday, your doctor would have told you that Donald Trump, having survived an assassination attempt, is neck and neck in the polls with Kamala Harris, who is now weighing possible vice presidential running mates to face off against J.D. Vance. And you would have thought that your doctor was having, to borrow a, a term of art, a cognitive fluctuation. Tonight, we'll talk about the entirely new race for president materializing before our eyes. Joining me tonight at the table, Peter Baker is the chief White House correspondent at the New York Times. Eugene Daniels is a White House correspondent and a co-author of Playbook at Politico. Adam Harris is my colleague and a contributing writer at The Atlantic. And Asma Khalid is a White House correspondent for NPR. So, yeah, a year's worth of news in that was a, a good week. Intro. It was. Yeah, well, yeah, no, it's true. It's true. You think about all the things that happen, there's too many things. That's why we're going to talk tonight. Um, <laughs> Peter, maybe you can start us off by just trying to lift up to 30,000 yeah. in, in feet. Uh, you know, in less than a month, we have reached this point. I revere this office, but I love my country more. So I've decided the best way forward is to pass the torch to a new generation. Even on June 28th, the day after the debate, yeah. we could not imagine that Kamala Harris is the nominee and, and running neck and neck in the polls right now. Yeah. It's a, how did we get here? Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? That Oval Office address that the president gave was his fourth of his presidency. It took three and a half years for him to give the first two. He gave the second two, the second pair, in 10 days. That's right. how accelerated this news cycle has been. And this is going to be a period that historians go back and look at for, I think, years and generations, right? Like the period before Nixon resigned or before LBJ decided not to run very different circumstances, but the idea that a presidency ends in something other than an election is a pretty rare thing in our lifetime. And we've now seen it happen in just 20, uh, 29, 30 days. And right. as you say, nobody would have thought a month ago that Kamala Harris would be the nominee, a putative nominee, and that she'd be running even if not, in fact, ahead of uh, Trump by a point or two. Right. What's the, Eugene, what's the most surprising thing to you in all of this? I mean, that it happened. <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I've been... All, all the journalists in Washington <laughs> are still in a bit of, like, shock. fatigue and shock, uh, right? Kind so of it's a little bit of a, like Frankenstein. There's a little bit PTSD. Um, yeah. Yeah, a lot of it. Um, you know, the thing that was on Sunday, right, when, when this letter pops off, everyone's kind of thinking, maybe it's maybe he's going to do it later. If, he's, if it's going to happen, it's not going to happen. We made it to Sunday. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's the middle of the day. Um, and when this comes out, I started calling folks. And I think what I was so surprised by was the amount of people who did not know this was coming. Oh, yeah. I yeah. talked to people on the campaign and people at the White House That's right. crying out of shock from yeah. what had just happened. People who huh. up and moved to Wilmington, Delaware mm -hmm. to work for this man and get him elected. And they had been promised up until that morning by senior advisors of the president, not the ones that were in Rehoboth with him, but the others, and said, 
you know, go full steam ahead. If a reporter asks you, you know, call them a big dummy. And you got that call. Same person. Um, <laughs> and, and, and that 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 continued over and over and over again. So I think the shock of it all. And then you have. I was talking to aides of Vice President Harris, and they're racing to the vice presidential residence, the Naval Observatory, because now she has to start making these calls. She made a hundred calls in ten hours mm -hmm. to senior officials in the party to basically say. You know, I want your support, and and I I didn't want the day to go by without you hearing from me. How much notice did she have, though? She didn't have very much. He called her that morning, is my understanding. You know, he made the decision on Saturday night. Him and his team started to write the letter in the morning. She's the first call of the people who weren't there, um, and lets her know, I am dropping. It's on you, kid, and and, and, <laughs> and and it's off to the races. They talked a few times, is my understanding, um, and she didn't have a lot of time. And so the aides that came to the Naval Observatory were basically told, like, just come. <laughs> we can't tell you why. And then they saw the letter. They're like, oh, that's we get it now. Yeah, we yeah. Get it. Asma, you're you're in the White House all the time. I, how did this how did this materialize so quickly after all of these promises? from the Biden team that this is never going to happen. Right? Yeah, I mean, the sense that we have is that Biden ultimately came to the conclusion, as he says, that it was just, there was not a winnable path for him. Um, I think what's remarkable to me, though, is how quickly the party seems to have coalesced behind Kamala Harris. I spent a lot of time over the last three and a half years, Eugene, too, you. covering the vice president. And I will argue, um, there's not a lot of journalists in Washington who've really spent that much time paying attention to her. There was a sense that the first year of her vice presidency was really rocky, um, and, and folks sort of thought she didn't have what it took to be president. I would argue that over the last year, at a lot of her public events, she was bringing out pretty sizable crowds, particularly on reproductive rights issues. But still, there was talk in the party that maybe she wasn't the right person, maybe she wasn't going to be able to beat Donald Trump. You look at what, it was a 24-hour mm -hmm. span in which she basically had accrued by Sunday Biden drive off Monday night she had enough com you know pledged committed delegates to be the likely presidential nominee that is extreme rapid speed so so the the the, que the obvious question is how much preparation did they do behind the scenes in secret just in case he dropped out it seems like this thing kind of came off pretty smoothly given the chaos I mean I heard from people who were helping her um, to organize those delegates that they started rapidly making calls on yeah, Sunday. Yeah. Uh, I don't know that there was advance notification. I heard that particularly black women within yeah, the Democratic right. Party quickly coalesced around her. Um, I think there became this inevitability to her very quickly, but I don't get the sense that there was an advance operation. No, I, don't, yeah. I don't think there was. I mean, they were the folks that are around her and are, are allies of her, I was calling them, mm -hmm. and they were like, what do you want? I got two minutes. Yeah. You know, and so those <laughs> kinds, because, you know, people like Donna Brazile had yeah. just started calling delegates for her, kind of creating kind of a whip operation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, her team quickly put together a, a list of these more than 100 um, Democrats to call. This all happened very fast, and it speaks to kind of a, a, a um, understanding of the gravity of mm -hmm. the situation, but also a, a, a fear a concern that there might have been a mini primary, even with President Biden saying that he, that it, it right. should have been. Hurt. Now, clearly, Barack Obama wanted a mini primary. <laughs> I mean, that's the. I mean, that, that he just endorsed uh, today. Uh, uh, and uh, I wonder. I mean, if you're getting any of you are getting the sense, Adam, anyone getting the sense that there's any kind of regret that they didn't have a, a mini primary, or are, is this week going so well? Has this week gone so well? for Kamala Harris, not just in comparison to J.D. Vance's week, which we will get to <laughs> in a moment, um, but is it going so well that people are like, oh, maybe this is the way it was supposed to go? Yeah, and I think that there's been a sort of groundswell of enthusiasm, not just from within the party, but also sort of the voters, right? If you're looking at polls of, um, you know, uh, likely voters, you're looking at, at polls of registered voters, you're seeing already um, these sort of large gaps uh, that she's made up from where Joe Biden was. Yeah. You know, early in July, um, you know, if you're thinking about black voters, if you're thinking about Hispanic voters, Joe Biden was running at about 63 percent favorability with black voters, 31 right. percent um, favorability with Hispanic voters. Oof. You fast forward to now and, you know, with Hispanic voters, she's really blowing that out of the water. She's at about 64 percent um, and 77 percent. So is this young voters? That yeah, yeah. has yeah. been a key problem for Biden. Right. Is this the end of the discussion, Peter? or Eugene, is this the end of the discussion about Donald Trump making huge inroads into the black and Hispanic population, especially males? 
I mean, it seemed hard to imagine he's going to do what he thought he was going to do, right? He thought he was going to sort of rewrite the political playbook, if you will, yeah. uh, to, uh, to, yeah. to be the He's always Republican. rewriting the playbook. Yes, yeah. well, <laughs> he's rewriting every night. Yes. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think so. What's sort of striking is, to, to Osmond's point, is that this is not the Kamala Harris of year one, but the no. Kamala Harris of year four, right? Yeah. She clearly is more seasoned. She is more confident. She gets up there at that rally in Milwaukee, and she's got that crowd, the biggest crowd that that campaign has had, bigger than any crowd that Joe Biden got, yeah. eating out of her hands. You and I, we've all been to these yeah. rallies for Joe Biden. They're tiny, and yeah. they're not enthusiastic. They're polite, but they're not, like, <laughs> energized. They were energized for her. Now, part of that's her, Mm-hmm. And part of that's that she's not Joe Biden, yeah. honestly, let's be real. For a lot of people, I think, that felt like the, it wasn't a campaign until this week, and suddenly they remember what it was like to have a candidate get up there and prosecute the case against Trump and deliver a line in a coherent, cogent way. Right. How long does not Joe Biden work, though? I mean, we only have, like, 102 days, so, you know, it doesn't have to work that long. I was <laughs> at that rally in Milwaukee, um, and, you know, me and some other reporters who had been covering her for a long time were like, oh, my God. Like, this is so... It was such a strange... You were not expecting to see it, it's what like, you It was thought. such it was a like strange a light situation. Was, for yeah. some and, like, reason. you have all of these... You know, these 3,000 people who, for the first time, this entire election, are excited. And there's an mm-hmm. energy that is, like, hard to kind of quantify other than, you know, is it is it is it her? Is it not Biden? It doesn't really matter at the mm-hmm. end of the day because right. they're excited, they're giving money, and more importantly, they're volunteering. I also think it's the moment because yeah. I remember yeah. you would go out with her, this is back in, you say, 2021, 2022, and voters would ask me, you know, I don't hear that much about her. What has she been up to? This was a routine question I would hear. Yeah. Um, and and she's been doing a lot, I would yeah. say, particularly on, on abortion issues, but I think it's this moment. It's this moment where she is able to make the case and say, as she often has been now on the campaign trail, that she's a prosecutor. He, Donald Trump, she says, is a convicted felon. It is a line that she can articulate in a very, both I would things say, are true. democratic base. It, yeah. Both things are true. It's interesting, Adam, though, we, we were talking about this, and we've been talking about this for years. Her, in 2020, after George Floyd, after the racial reckoning uh, period, um, that being a prosecutor was not considered a positive. <laughs> on yeah. now that now that time has elapsed, time has passed, and it turns out that she's running against the first convicted felon to ever be nominated for a major party nomination. Talk about the shift in the zeitgeist around <laughs> around her resume. Yeah, yeah. You know, going through that primary season, going into um, the election season, even after she was chosen for VP, you did hear a lot of young voters say that, well, if you look at her record in California as a prosecutor, right, it wasn't something Coppola. that they really... Mm-hmm. Yeah, Coppola. Coppola. Yeah, yeah. It was something that they weren't really excited about. It was also something they were kind of knocking her for. But in this cycle, right, you're one prosecuting Trump. You're also saying, you know, if this is a guy who is trying to run his campaign about law and order, you know, <laughs> someone who is a prosecutor, it's like, well, which one is it going to be? Right. Is she a cop or is she um, so liberal that she's going to be really soft on crime? Right. And they, they have to pick one of those lanes. But, you know, her position is that, well, you know, you saw me uh, engaging Jeff Sessions when I was in the mm-hmm. Senate. You know, you've seen how I operate and how I'm able to prosecute this case against Trump and his attacks on democracy. And I think that that's really I, I also think that she is far better and, and appeals more to a Democratic base when she is on the uh, offense against yes. Trump than she is when she's trying to articulate an affirmative vision for herself. I think that's why she tr- struggled, you know, during that primary cycle. It was a crowded field of Democrats in 2020. Her job is different in this moment. Well, in the primary cycle, we couldn't really get a sense of what she believed. I mean, she was running from parts of her record and... and very and, tactical. Yes. Yeah, 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 it seemed overly tactical. See, so now, I mean, she owns the Biden record. The Republicans say that's a bad thing, but for the Democratic base, it's actually a good thing. Mm-hmm. And she didn't have to necessarily articulate a new vision, but I think that part of the problem was that the people who have drifted away from Biden 2020 are people who the Democrats believe need to be reminded why they didn't like Trump in the first place. Right. And she's able to seem like, seemingly to prosecute that in a better way than he was. Yeah. Okay, but let's talk about strengths and weaknesses mm-hmm. for a couple more minutes. Um, the Trump, look, we know that the Trump campaign is run by a very smart guy, Chris LaCivita, um, who, among other things, turned John Kerry's Vietnam service, yeah. mm-hmm. wartime service against him, the, the whole swift boating um, I- I incident. So my question is, obviously, the Trump people are, they're, they're scrambling. Yeah. They weren't planning on running against her, yeah. and that's clear. Um, but, but when they figure out what to do, how effective are they gonna be, and what, 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 what weaknesses or, or alleged weaknesses are they gonna be targeting? I th- 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the biggest thing they're going to do is call her the border czar, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to say that she was in charge of the border and that that's why it's so bad. She wasn't the border czar. Um, I was on the press call when they explained it. Uh -huh. You know, she was dealing with Northern Triangle ir irregular immigration and the issues and why people were leaving the countries. It doesn't really matter, right, in this in this time. Because border czar makes it sound like you're in charge of in the your, law your, enforcement your, exactly. at the, at the actual not. line. Yeah. They're going, obviously, they're going to come at her with the Bi with Biden inflate with Biden inflation, right? right? Bidenomics, that that was a bad thing. You know, they're going to, they've already been hitting her on kind of that she is, is mealy mouth which is not true anymore, right? That 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 she's someone um, who kind of had a struggle at the times talking about different types of things. That's gone. I will also say something that's really important is that we've already seen a lot of racism and sexism, and that's going to be a, a huge part of this campaign. And Republican leadership are talking to them behind the scenes and saying, please cut it out. There are things that we can actually talk about here, but calling her a DEI hire and being sexist about it, I won't say the things that they've been saying. Wait, I want to get clear yeah. on this. Who is saying not to do it and who Mike, is... Speaker Mike Johnson has talked to House Republicans and told them to, to cut it out because oh, it's and they not always helpful. Listen. They have, they're very, yes, he has lots of control I mean, over that. I mean, some famously that don't listen to him, yeah. obviously. Part of, yeah. part of what they're the going to be able to do, they're not going to say DEI candidate, at least some of them won't. Uh, they're going to say socialist, right? right and right. that also has a obvious... Kind of Connotation, connotation yeah. right? And they couldn't really say it very effectively about Joe Biden because he's well known to the country. He's been here for 50 years. He's kind of, you know, Scranton Joe. Nobody thinks he's a socialist. She is a person of color, a woman of color from, from California, from, from San Francisco. Left, we'll say, and even yeah. though in San Francisco she was thought of as being too, too right wing, too too right -wing right. Mm -hmm. to the rest of the country, that's an easy uh, uh, right. sale to make. A Adam, I mean, let's talk about it frankly. How big a, how big an issue will be will racism and misogyny be? Where you know she's a she's a twofer. Obviously, she's a woman of color. We've never mm -hmm. seen this in a presidential campaign. Um, are does she lose support uh, because of who she is? Or are the people who are not apt to vote for a woman of color the people who would never vote for a Democrat anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, it seems like there's a base of people who it might be built in where if you're not going to vote, if you weren't going to vote for a woman of color, you weren't going to vote for a woman, period, then that that's sort of who who you were, right? But I think what, what Kamala is looking at now, or the vice president is looking at now, is sort of how she's going to be able to expand that base, right? Part of that comes through the VP pick. Um, you know, looking at, you know, maybe she won't get, pull in as many white working class voters in places like Pennsylvania or Michigan, right? That's something that could be solved by the vice presidential pick. But she's also pulling back people mm -hmm. um, who the party assumed that they lost, right? The yeah. Detroit News poll um, today, right, has her at about 88 um, percent with <laughs> with black voters. Uh, you know, there were a little couple of irregularities in that poll. But right. So, so one so of the big glimpses of that is this week there were a number of sort of what I would call affinity group Zooms. <laughs> <laughs> and right, yeah. the, the largest one that they One say quite crash surprising, them, yeah. was yeah. white women for Harris. Yeah. And there is this. There's a white news for Harris. Right? Yes. Too, yeah. But I think to there me is. that is an, and these yeah. are like popping up. There were ones within the South Asian community, yeah. the broader Asian community, black women, black men. And to me, it, you know, there are certainly voters for whom her identity will be a liability. I would also argue there is a chunk of the electorate for whom it is viewed as an asset. Well, let's talk well, about the vice presidential uh, sweepstakes for a moment. <laughs> it seems. There's, there, 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 you know, there's different, you hire different vice presidents to, to serve different needs. Eugene, you've studied this. Um, you, it seems on the face of it that Josh Shapiro, popular governor of, let's say, the most key, key state, state the, yeah. the, the, the absolute key keystone state, um, <laughs> uh, seems like a pretty <laughs> obvious thing to do, especially because he has more of a centrist reputation. He pulls the, pulls the ticket a little bit toward the, the middle, but uh, talk about how how they might be thinking about who we hire for this role. It's kind of an old saying in, in politics. You There's three types of vice pres presidential picks. One is the one for June, November, and January. June is to get the party excited during the convention. November is to win. January is a governing partner. Mm -hmm. People with around Harris are saying that she's looking for a governing partner, right? So she's looking for someone that kind of thinks the way that she thinks, sees the world and the way that she views it and, and is kind of thinking about, like, you know, their, their um, middle class, you know, from the bottom up, middle yeah. out kind of thing that they have been talking about. She is also going to have to, at some point, decide which of these 
men, because that's who mm -hmm. that they're, they're largely looking at, white men, um, she's going to pick who could help her in one of these states. You could probably make an argument for any of these men. Josh Shapiro, obviously, Mark Kelly in Arizona, right? That's a pick where um, you, then you pick up a different type of state. You know, Roy Cooper at North, in North Carolina, how does he help there? And maybe Georgia. Maybe Georgia, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's yeah. all these different types of calculations that they're, that they're trying to make. And they're vetting them, the fastest vetting that, that probably has ever happened. And so the Well, the choice, fastest vetting since J.D. Vance. That's what <laughs> Which we'll get to. Uh -huh, uh -huh, sure. Keep promising that we're going to get there. Yeah, we're going to get there at some yeah, point. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 but so, so, so in other words, you think that they're, they're arguing that they're looking for a governing partner, but let's not kid let's ourselves. Not kid. Well, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Peter, <laughs> Peter and I are like, yeah, okay. Always okay yeah, but she's always, done this. Yeah. She's been I know. the vice president. I, I, I know, right? but so Peter, why were you going to? What was the cynical question? I don't want somebody who could be president. I want somebody who can win the state. No, yeah. They don't say yeah, that. No, it's, right? But course. they have to win Pennsylvania. They have yeah. to win Pennsylvania. But, or, or, or a combination yeah, of I mean, that's the, the question is whether or not, right, if, if she loses votes for whatever reason we just talked about in some of these states, does she pick them up in other states that they have basically given up? They've basically given up Nevada, Arizona, and Georgia. Does she scramble that map? Now, Mark Kelly seems like, I mean, the resume is, is perfect. There's one problem with, uh, with the Senate seat, but, I mean, Mark Kelly seems like sort of an obvious yeah. choice. Uh, I mean, I'm not asking you to speculate, but I am. <laughs> yeah. But I am. No, yeah, it, it is. Right? If, you, if you think about his, his resume, right, a... Um, you know, you're running against an astronaut. One of the, <laughs> John Glenn, right? Prosecutor, you, you're running, no one wants to run against an astronaut. Um, but as you said, right, you lose you 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 lose him in the Senate. You lose a very popular person in Arizona. So you know, and, and you it might be, not it get for, Arizona. Exactly. Right. Mm -hmm. right. And it would not get yeah. two years. But I mean, broadly, if you look at all the names that are on the serious short list, we're talking about white men. And to me, this is interesting because what she seems to be trying to do, and what Democrats want to do, is to really broaden out the demographics. Yeah. And it is a strike difference going back to J.D. Vance from what we right. saw with Trump, which he doubled down on his own base. Oh, and thank you for raising this <laughs> up to J.D. Vance, because like, there, there's a guy who didn't have a, a great week, and in part because of things like this. I want you to watch this for a second. When you go to the polls in this country as a parent, you should have more power, you should have more of an ability to speak your voice in our democratic republic than people who don't have kids. Let's face the consequences and the reality. If you don't have as much of an investment in the future of this country, maybe you shouldn't get nearly the same voice. Now, people will say, and I'm sure the Atlantic and the Washington Post and all the usual suspects will criticize me about this in the coming days. Well, doesn't this mean that non-parents don't have as much of a voice as parents? Doesn't this mean that parents get a bigger say in how our democracy functions? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just want to know for the record, the Atlantic didn't say anything about that. <laughs> <laughs> to the best of my knowledge, but but in the, in a couple of minutes we have left. What is what is going on with with JD Vance? I mean, this seems like a troubled pick. Well, <laughs> he certainly challenges normal Americans who may or may not have kids, but certainly don't believe. But this isn't the only one. Ones. No, of course not. He says it again and again, forgetting, of course. And double down today on yeah. Megyn Kelly. And that, yeah. by the way, yeah. George Washington didn't have kids. He had stepkids, right? We had the right. whole. Like the father of the country yeah. literally so this was. This is never something the founders thought was a good idea. Of course, everybody has an right. investment in this country, whether you have kids or not. So my question is, is Donald Trump, there's some speculation that Trump may be regretting this pick. Mm -hmm. Does it, I mean, do we have any sense of that or is that just idle speculation at this point? It, that he's, you know, he's uncomfortable with the coverage, I would say, of his of his vice presidential pick. Right. This is a man who cares deeply about what the media says about him, even though he he fights with fights with us a lot, and how people look at him and the mm -hmm. folks around his campaign. He didn't. He got he had beef with Steve Bannon because Steve Bannon was too far ahead and was kind of the mastermind. Everyone yeah. was saying. And so now you're looking at JD Vance have not just a rough week where people are finding this Oppo. Democrats are all of a sudden are very good at finding Oppo research um, on on candidates, but he's you know he's having awkward interactions on at, at rallies. He's having kind of weird videos of the of what's happening right now. That is making him and his folks uncomfortable. To be fair, well, let, let me ask you this in just thirty seconds: the does he bring any advantages that you could see right now? Because that could be much very much the case. Uh, I think he doubles down on the already existing demographic that Trump had. So I don't think he really broadens out the party. If anything, his comments about 
you know, women in particular saying that they were childless cat ladies, um, I think really hurts some Republican women as well. College educated Republican women have been moving away from the party, white college educated voters. Uh, I don't think this helps them. There's a lot of people who don't have kids, a lot of people who want to have kids who also struggle to have kids. Right. Uh, I, in, the, in the couple of seconds we have left, just based on your survey of the possible Democrats out there, who would you most like to see for sheer illumination reasons, debate J.D. Vance? Could be a very interesting debate if they uh, actually have a debate. Yeah, I, I actually, I think, honestly, Governor Bashir uh, would be interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and then also um, Josh Shapiro. Josh Shapiro. Mm -hmm. um, it's gonna be very interesting to watch this choice. Um, We'll talk about it next week, because unfortunately we need to leave it there for now. Um, but I want to thank our panelists for joining us, and to our viewers at home, thanks for watching. Before we go, we want to congratulate Eugene Daniels, <laughs> who recently took over the presidency of the White House Correspondents <laughs> Association. Here's uh, the current president <laughs> with the current vice president. Um, and for some reason, the president doesn't have to wear a tuxedo to the White House well, Correspondents Dinner, <laughs> like the rest of us. Um, and for more on how J.D. Vance felt about Donald Trump back in 2016, please visit theatlantic.com. I'm Jeffrey Goldberg. Good night from Washington. Corporate funding for Washington Week with The Atlantic is provided by Consumer Cellular. Additional funding is provided by Ku and Patricia Ewan for the Ewan Foundation, committed to bridging cultural differences in our communities. Sandra and Carl DeLay Magnuson, Rose Herschel and Andy Shreves, Robert and Susan Rosenbaum, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.